Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for putting me, program me just after that fantastic talk. Um, that was really good, really enjoyable. Um, I'm probably going to come a little bit more prosaic and the approach I'm going to take over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, what I want to do, and I'd like all of you as FAME members, um, and I'll pick up a word that uh, uh, Kenneth just used, opportunities. Um, we've got, over the past 20 years, uh, TI has been actively involved in all aspects of archaeology and cultural heritage. And as FAME members, we're, or sorry, for you as FAME members, I'd like you just to listen to my talk and sort of think, this isn't just aimed at the major contractors. It's not just aimed at the consultancies. It's also aimed at specialists so that you could find yourselves having opportunities here. I'm not necessarily spelling them all out, but I am just want to just plant that seed with you, and that's really why I'm here over the past couple of days in New York. Um, so just bear in mind that I'm, it's not just, you know, there's maybe opportunities here that you could pick up on, and uh, we'll be very happy to talk to you at any point uh, down the line. Um, just to get started, I want to let you know a little bit about TI, Transport Infrastructure Ireland. We're state agency, semi-state agency, and our responsibility is national roads, public transport, or sorry, light rail, metro, uh, greenways, active travel, uh, tra travel schemes. And we're also involved in major construction of motorways, interchanges, tunnels, etc. We're also involved in um, upgrades of the rural towns in Ireland. So it's a very widespread uh, amount of projects. We also have a, um, we're keyed into all of TI's capital programs. Um, one of the key things about uh, TI itself is, you know, just, just from our seven strategy, and I've just highlighted one word in there, sustainable. It's about sustainable transport infrastructure. But sustainability is a lens with which we are um, enjoined, enforced, required as TI employees to adopt every single action that we take, every decision we make, we have to put a sustainability lens onto it. Um, even on last week, uh, I did my performance management uh, development, and in there it sort of says, okay, what specific actions have you taken as a TI employee to try to enforce sustainability agenda and to roll that out? Um, so again, that's a lens I just invite you to uh, think about. Uh, archaeology and heritage, I'm head of archaeology and heritage, and our job is minim minimize uh, the impact, archaeological impact of our schemes and programs. And we do that through a sort of a tripartite model. We do it in the context of legislation, regulation. It's the law, we have to. Uh, and we obviously operate at both uh, European and uh, national legislation. We also, in the context of risk, and really 90% of my colleagues, um, my job and my colleagues' job, is all about risk management, risk reduction. We, I always say we never eliminate risk, we minimize risk, we make it manageable. That's our, that's our role. And then the third element uh, is the public trust, public value piece. That is absolutely crucial. We spend considerable amount of money, of uh, taxpayers' money, public monies, on our works. We want to ensure that those works are actually have a benefit. So we're always thinking in terms of that whole life, looking at things in uh, in the long term, looking at those impacts. How can we how can we feed that back in? A document. Any of you working in Ireland or been working in Ireland for the past twenty years at any of the schemes will have come across either the code of practice that was published in 2017, or the predecessor back in uh, 2007 for the RPA and uh, 2000 and 2040 and National Roads Authority. Those documents are our rules of engagement. I use that document on a, a weekly, fortnightly basis. I go back to it. It's our, it's our Bible. That sets out the uh, rules of engagement between ourselves as semi-state agency, uh, implementing government transport policy, and also um, the Minister for uh, Responsibility for Heritage, National Monument Service, and their responsibilities to protect uh, heritage and archaeology specifically. Um, one big thing about the 2017 code in comparison to the previous codes, it takes a whole life approach. It's all about project commencement, uh, inception, right way through to completion. And as we all know with uh, archaeological projects, our completion date doesn't always marry up with the completion date of the project itself. We can have a much longer tail. Um, and kind of going back to that piece around specialists, in Ireland we have a shortage of specialists. That means that we don't always get our projects finished because we don't necessarily have conservation, we don't necessarily have all the osteoarchaeologists, we don't have a radiocarbon dating lab in Ireland. So we will use um, Beta, uh, Suark, um, what are called, um, Queens, and so on. 
Um, but it does mean that there's a that that those projects do necessarily have a kind of a longer tail there. But it's that whole life piece. Also, uh, a key thing about it is making sure that in that public uh, trust piece, that public value piece, the information we collect is made available back to our uh, to people through our digital heritage collections online, so that all of our material can be accessed at a point in the future. Uh, similarly, the um, what's called yeah, similarly digital collections, similarly our books and so on. And I'll talk a little bit about those. What I want to do uh, now is just spend a little bit of time talking about a couple of uh, initiatives that we've, uh, uh, shall I say, successfully implemented this year. First off, Culture Heritage um, Impact Assessment Guidelines. These were published in February of uh, this year. They were uh, led by um, AMS, in particular, Bryn Coldrick, uh, one of their uh, principal archaeologists there. And those have been uh, really a big change for us. We've been working them for the past uh, three, sorry, not a big change, actually, I have to definitely say it's not a big change. It's codifying existing practice, bringing up, um, shall I say, uh, putting manners on it, so to speak. Um, a phrase that I've used in relation to a lot is that this is uh, evolution of revolution. It's not changing everything, but it is trying to bring the best practice we've had, like the original predecessor guidelines were out in 2005, and those were just concerned with archaeology and architectural heritage. These new guidelines take into account cultural heritage in the broader sweep of things. So it's not just about de um, designated sites, it's not just about designated archaeological sites, it's about the whole sweep of archaeology, the whole sweep of cultural heritage. Um, in Ireland, we've just gone through the decade of uh, uh, commemorations. Uh, that's from 1916, War of Independence, Civil War. There's a lot of archaeological, a lot of cultural heritage, a lot of uh, built heritage that is associated with uh, those events. They're not necessarily listed. They don't necessarily have any protections, statutory protections, but from a, shall I say, public trust point of view, from a public value point of view, from a community value point of view, they're incredibly important. And we wanted to capture that, that sense, that changing sense. Um, another key thing that we did, we want to make sure that the documents that we produce are keyed into TI's broader project management guidelines. We didn't want to produce a set of guidelines or documents that uh, are contradict the broader suite. So we actually delayed the publication of the guidelines until these, until those PMG um, update came out so that they'll be consistent because we didn't want to confuse the industry. We know that the industry is you're inundated with standards, inundated with guidelines all the time. And it's uh, unfair as a uh, client body uh, to be putting stuff out and then just, uh, you know, disrupting it. We know that we're aware that it can create difficulties for you. So we wanted to minimize that. And that was why alignment was important. We've got a sustainability piece there. Another key thing that we've got in there is professional judgment. We want quality outputs. We want quality work. We want to make sure, we do not want people just to download data lists off the internet and present them as reports. That's quick, that's easy. It's not useful for us. Going back to that risk management piece, uh, we've got so many, it's the risks that we don't know about that we're concerned, but even more than just that, it's the risks that the local communities that we're going through and we turn around to them and say, well, that's, and there's a, a site there, um, a, what called a, a cross from the 1930s Eucharistic Congress, and that has no designation, no value in terms of any designated lists. However, for the community down along that road, that's an incredibly important piece. Um, if we have consultants come along and say, well, it's not important because it's not on the list, that does not help. That undermines our projects. We have to be able to have that local sensitivity, local awareness, bring that local awareness on board. Um, so professional judgment, absolutely critical. The process itself, culture impact assessment, I've just used this sort of, uh, graphic of sort of like a snake that as it kind of wings its way through, you start off phase one, your, your constraints uh, study, your overview area. Then you get into your opportunity selection study and through various phases, yearly phases, what were the concerned areas about? Avoiding sites. The mitigation there, it's, you know, first off, you establish the uh, area that you're in. Secondly, you're going to collate all your sources, bring them all together. Thirdly, you're going to assess it. Fourth, you're going to mitigate. Mitigation in our early phases is all around avoidance. But what we do want to do is we do want to document that avoidance. We do want to make sure that people can say, yeah, you've actually, we have actually taken that into account and we have made a decision and it descoped it um, or removed it uh, as a potential uh, risk. Um, when we're getting down to the final phase of phase three, 
Uh, that's when our EIR, Environmental Impact Assessment Report, is produced. And then we're going into our st statutory process at phase four. And again, at that phase three, that's when our other standard mitigations will come in. And I'll go to, onto that in a minute. Um, just a couple of things, what we're concerned about. As you start from the project, uh, first up, we want these to be done using a GIS. GIS is far more effective, far more efficient to actually roll it out. It also gives greater control of the data, great flexibility with the data. So we are um, pushing the industry down the GIS route. We want people to use GIS, and the majority of people are already doing that. Um, another thing we also want people to start doing is to, during your phase two, your options is um, selection, and during your environmental impact assessment, to actually start documenting importance. So as you're doing it, you're going to start documenting the importance of the site. So when you go into the statutory uh, planning hearing, that you're actually able to say, this has this importance. And it's based on, the, it's based on that moment in time. So we expect things to change. Um, the next graphic just shows you the different field works. And so going from phase one to start, up to phase three uh, on the uh, right hand side. We expect that we're going to start off lots and lots of information, very broad, Loads of sites being considered, and, but you'll have a shallow amount of uh, material about it. As we work our way through the process, we're going to get increasingly more and more information, more and more detail, more and more understanding about a site. So you may start to uh, have a, a site at the beginning that you say, that's only moderate level importance, but as the process goes on, it becomes uh, high or potentially very high. But you can have that and vice versa. Things can go up and down. Um, one thing that we'll be saying is that this is saying that at our initial phase, we're not expecting fieldwork to take place. We are expecting our uh, fieldwork to take place through the subsequent phases there. Speaking of fieldwork methodologies, ubiquitous now is LIDAR. We use LIDAR on our, our projects, um, and we do that at phase two. And we, when we talk about LIDAR, uh, we're talking about both the collection of the data as one body of work, and then a separate work stream is the analysis of the data. And that's the kind of place that I would see uh, companies in this room. Many of you would have the expertise to carry out LIDAR uh, work. Um, and let's point that out. The other thing we're doing is about field walking. Clearly, when you're getting to your phase three, you're walking the routes. That's fine. Geophysical survey, you're doing your geophysical, uh, geophysical surveys across the board. Again, just on geophysical survey, we're actually going to be updating our guidelines in our next Project Archaeology framework, and we'll be in review of the current ones at the moment. So again, there's an opportunity for yourselves. Um, we also carry out all the other range of work methodologies, testing, um, inspections, built heritage surveys, underwater, et cetera. But they'll be done on a case-by-case -case basis. In terms of the process itself, it's identified uh, some uh, new, new deliverables or deliverables which are codified. Um, past couple years, we've actually had this thing called assessment method statements being um, uh, rolled out. And that's really the who, why, where, when, what, how of the project. It's to capture the assumptions. So for you, uh, drafting it as consultants, um, putting these assessment themes together, you can have an understanding that your client knows what to expect. And if there's any doubt, you can sort it out um, at that time, rather than you commencing a whole lot of work and then discovering that the client isn't, isn't happy with it. So it's trying to uh, minimize some of those risks there. Uh, other things taking place, mentioned the culture data dataset. Uh, again, this is something that we want to use with, with the GIS. So related to cultural heritage data sets, the project archive. We all know we've been in so many projects over the years where projects, you will collect far more information than will necessarily end up in the EIR. And that is actually useful. You know, we don't need to go back and recollect it all over again. So we can actually collect into project archive. It can then be used at another date. It can have a life beyond it. It's not just wasted effort. And I think that's a, an important one. The other thing is there's a reality that uh, we have seen schemes get to a particular phase, and somebody says, OK, right, funding is cut. We're going to wrap it up. It goes at the end of phase three. We're not going to proceed with this particular scheme. If we actually collate that data, that project archive, when it's picked up at a later date, it's a, a head start. It doesn't mean that we're not going to do archaeology. And we all know that there's a data sets change. And every time you go on to uh, the Chelsea Historic Environment Viewer for National Monuments, the National Monument Service run, there's a new update on data.gov.ie which means it is a, a new set of data to be considered. It's not to circumvent work down the line, but it's just to help us make things easier. Um, and then we've also got the Cultural Heritage Mitigation Plan. 
and that's going to feed in of all the uh, mitigations that we've identified at our phase three and have been presented at phase four will then be fed into our uh, construction environment uh, management plan. Quick thing just about significance of effect and importance. Um, the left hand side there, we've just got our baseline importance, which we expect it's a very high down to uh, negligible. We expect that to be adopted at phase two. So that again, as, the, uh, as consultants, um, you'll be making a case why you believe a site should be of very high significance or another site moderate significance. It's that, that case that there's a, going back to that professional judgment piece, that when you're making a statement, is that you back that statement up, that you provide evidence. Um, the other thing is then considering the, the magnitude of the, the impact. So again, it's kind of going to a piece by proportionality. Um, and then it goes on to significance of effect. Now, this is something that we have been doing for years um, in terms of documenting in our lists of sites all of the actual, um, uh, shall we say, the sites there and the mitigations required. We have recent le legislation from our recent court cases where we have to be focused in on everything above not significant. So this is from the Environmental Protection Agency's um, 2022 guidelines. And in there, it's sort of adapted for cultural heritage purposes. So we need to have mitigation set down for everything that is slight, moderate, significant, very significant, and profound. Just move to mitigations. This is all very straightforward stuff to everyone here. We do want to capture our avoidance, obviously. I mentioned that already. Our prevention, our fencing off during uh, groundworks, our reduction, screening, and so on. And then when we can't do any of those things, then we get into our um, excavations, our investigations, and so on. How do we implement it? We implement through our stage one, two, four contracts. Anybody working in Ireland on, um, what shall I say, GCC contracts, public contracts, will have come across this concept of stage one to four. Um, you've also then got our enabling works, advanced enabling works contracts there. So that's for fencing, uh, tree, uh, short, what called tree removal and so on. Um, and then you've got the main works contracts. Each of those things will have cultural heritage, archeological um, shows and mitigations built into them. We then actually sort of, uh, another point I actually like to make this slide, I always like to make this slide is, we know that we are not going to know all of the archaeology out there when we go to planning consent. Our planning authority is well aware that we cannot have full view of the archaeology. They know that there is a, a massive risk there because it is hidden. It's, uh, it's an unforeseen risk. Or it's a, yeah, Don, we'll, we'll go back to our good friend Don Rumsfeld there and sort of say it's unforeseeable, unknown unknowns. Uh, it's a problem. But because of that, when we actually do get consent, when do you get planning permission, at that point, we actually will carry out um, a massive amount of uh, trenching. We do typically 12% uh, trenching across a route to identify any of the archaeology. And we, we know that it's not perfect. But we know that this actually gives you so much better than not doing it. Or, you know, it's um, the best approach that we can find that has worked. And that generally allows us on our Greenfield projects to deal with 90% of the archaeology and uh, archaeology mitigation is completed before construction starts. So from a risk management point of view, that means you're not having archeologists and um, constructions uh, on top of each other. Uh, it's, it were, it's an approach that has, we've been using it since the early 2000s. The board on board Penola are aware of it. Our planning authorities are aware of it. They, they know that it works and it's a, it has successful outcomes. Um, just highlight up there a couple of other things. You've got your refurbishment works on your architectural heritage sites. You've also got uh, through our greenway work, and this is uh, uh, something that has come in in the past couple of years. We're now doing a huge amount of uh, more work on greenways and active travel programs. And that's also uh, having slightly different philosophy, whereas our national roads are moving away from sites, are trying to avoid sites. Our greenway programs and our amenity programs are actually pulling people into sites. And the decision making around those routes is different, but it's also giving us an opportunity to have. Um, uh, in greater amenities, you know, so that you're talking about public groundworks, you're talking about display boards, you're talking about uh, audio books, you're talking about other things in which people can engage. Um, speak of books, we just published there our 44th book, I think, uh, Place for the Living, Place for the Dead, um, with Colm Rubicon, shout out there. Um, we're delighted with that, and it's something that we would see that as part of our the mitigation process, that at the end of the day, going back to that public value piece, you want to get the, get the work uh, done. Um, and I think it's, it has worked. The system has worked for the past number of years. Uh, just kind of going back to the guidelines for a second. 
in the guidelines, there's this essential requirements tabs. They're very useful. They just set out what are the tasks, what are the outputs. So a good, uh, a good thing to uh, check in on. Um, we've only launched them in February, so I would appreciate any feedback you have, any observation you have, and also coming from totally different perspectives. I would really like that, so that it's not just about uh, what works in Ireland. Other countries, like we know that we're all challenged dealing with these problems all over the world, so we really would welcome any kind of feedback, and particularly from an architectural heritage person um, or anyone else, because we need to get that to understand that we're actually on the right track. A uh, couple of things which I'll talk about. Um, we've got this machine learning model, which we published earlier on in the year, and this is uh, for automatic detection of archaeological features. It's uh, done with consorting with the Discovery Program, and that, that of shall we say, model, allows us to take LiDAR data at phase two, and then when we take that LiDAR data, we can then incorporate it into models. It is set up to identify uh, various types of enclosures. Those enclosures are um, enclosures, ring forts, barrows, miscellaneous. Once those enclosures are done, we can. if you take that QR code, it can actually bring to GitHub, and you can download the software there. Um, it's open source software, so we hope that this will be something that other people will build on. And um, it came from our research program in TI, so it meant that we were, uh, every so often we will actually put out something with the research program. And one thing we're very keen on is when we do something like that, that does have a, um, a, um, a long-lasting impact. It's not research for sake of research. It carries out to turn into set of guidelines and the contract specifications. As happens, a couple of our contracts that were went out this week all included reference to this, to this software. So you're going to see that more and more. Speaking of uh, guidelines, uh, paleo environmental guidelines, uh, IAC, also a FAME member, um, has just uh, is in the process of carrying out a review and update of our paleo environmental guidelines, which were produced in um, 2012 with the last update in 2015. And that was done through our uh, project archaeologist framework. The purpose of that is to ensure that, um, well, that's aligned with our contracting practices, it's aligned with uh, up to date techniques. Um, I see uh, when they went out to do the, um, shall we say, put together the new guidelines or the update, they actually engaged with site staff. Uh, they did a lot of consultation across the, in across the industry to ensure to get the, the maximum um, amount of knowledge so that it gives us the best year. Similarly, we've got uh, ARAP are, uh, are doing our C14 dating and sampling uh, guidelines, and that's doing basin analysis with Katharina Becker and Eric Hamilton. And those guidelines, are going to provide a, a, a suite of, um, with the paleo environmental, the dating, and also archaeological guidelines, which we published a, uh, a couple of years ago. It's going, we're going to be having training sessions in the new year, and those training sessions will probably be, well, sorry, they will be online. They'll be um, a hybrid sessions. And we want to try to have a, shall we say, a consistent approach. A comment I'd make about the guidelines is we only do guidelines where we feel there's a gap. We're not just doing guidelines for the sake of doing guidelines. We're not just sort of uh, doing it. So if somebody else has got a set of guidelines, I'm particularly interested in the um, carbon uh, tool uh, from earlier on today. I'm going to have a, a chat with the lads there later on. If there's something that we can use, I'm very happy for us to, to take that on board. Um, the final thing we're doing is in-house, we've got a, um, a doc called Communicating Archaeology from 2010. We're just uh, updating that to reflect this broader speed, uh, broader space around cultural heritage, broader understanding. And again, those three guidelines will be delivered in December this year. Um, yeah, final slide. Uh, opportunities on national roads, greenways, public transport projects. eTenders.gov.ie, that is a place that, if you're interested in working in Ireland, have a look there. That will give you a sense of what's coming up, what's going on. A um, couple of other things. We've got a Project Archaeology Associated Service Framework, and that framework provides us with the resources and a mechanism for us to get guidelines produced, as you've seen from AMS and IAC. It also provides us a mechanism to have um, to, to strengthen our own in-house resources by actually uh, putting in project archaeologists onto the team. Um, so that's going to be advertised later in the year. Uh, we also have LIDAR analysis, and I mentioned that we've got a couple of them going out. Uh, there'll be more going out uh, this year. RQGFIS, stages one, two, four, that'll be very suitable for contracting companies. But then there's also the specialist works, conservation works, um, C14, osteoarchaeological, other works that potentially could be in there. I should caveat, caveat that all works have to be done in accordance with 
Irish legislation, Irish regulation, but that's, that, go, that goes without saying. Um, a couple of specific projects that are going through planning at the moment. You've got uh, Metrolink, and there are a number of people in the room who have already worked on Metrolink in uh, one form or another. And we've also then got, so there's advanced works coming up, and then there's also going to be a main works contract. So those are uh, something to keep an eye on. Uh, we've got Gory Ring Road. Uh, that's a fairly ma a major project. Again, that's uh, going through planning approval. And similarly, the NM20 Limerick Cork. So those are three very large schemes that we're going to see in the next couple of years. And uh, that's, that's pretty much me. So I take any questions or wherever you want to go.